geek psychology has brought up the topic, more or less, of us being a crowd, individuals actually not really being individuals, but rather being individuals, meaning that people can be divided. Now, <clears throat> as I see it, I'm going to use Enneagram to explain this. It's important to have a single identity within a culture. This is sometimes called um, it's sometimes called an ego. It's not really what the ego is technically, but, but uh, it's one use of the word ego or mask, social mask, like lawyer or doctor or something, some kind of profession name. Professional names are so important that they became people's actual names. They became last names of people. Tons of people have last names, carpenter, and things like that. Their professions became their last names. Where was it going with this? I'm already lost. Already so lost. Already so lost. The reason I'm, I'm so lost is because I'm not an individual on a one-track thing. I'm an I'm individual. I'm, I'm different people at the same time with different interests. However, in a social sense, you want to have one thing. Otherwise, people are going to get confused, and they're not going to know who you are, and they're going to test you to see what your fundamental core identity is or at least mask, is Enneagram sixes in the middle of society. A lot of them are SJs, not all of them. But they will test you to see who you are and if you're the leader or not. Nines are most typically the type that is a lot of different people. A lot of, or they, they look at the, they can look at Enneagram and type themselves as every type. Or they can look at MBTI and not know what their type is. And I've done this. And I am an INFJ. Um, but I have, I first typed as INFP. And then when I got into cognitive functions, paid attention to the insides of who I am as a individual and really noticed that my type preference meets INFJ a lot more. So the rule of thumb, for me at least, of if you're wondering if you're INFP and INFJ and can't decide you're an INFP, that rule of thumb doesn't work for me. Because there was a period, I mean, it all really matters what you're looking at. There's so many different sources for typology, whether you're looking at MBTI in a very basic pop psychology sense, or if you're looking into socionics or something in the middle. I don't type out anymore. However, I do get into real understandings and real like real zoomed in positions of specific cognitive functions. So like if I really zoom into TI, I can for a moment think that I'm ISTP or INTP, most commonly INTP, because it's it is very hard to see myself as a sensor. But there are situations where I don't know, there's, there's got to be certain zones where it's easy to get into other people's types. They're not really other people's types because they all exist within the human mind. And the human mind has uh, homoousios in a certain sense. It's the same substance. All human minds are the same substance. They're all in there. And if you talk about type preference, it means at a certain point in your life, you picked, more or less, a type. That's the more of a nurture point of view. A nature point of view is you were born with your type, but you still have all eight of the cognitive functions within you because it's based on splitting up a mind into eight parts. That's what cognitive functions are. Everything the mind does 
in a phenomenological sense, meaning what we actually experience as phenomenon. We're not talking about chemical studies of the brain. We're talking about what actually goes on in the brain that you experience. Cut that up into eight pieces. That's cognitive functions. Everybody's got them all, and we use them. We all use them all every day. Even if we're using the ones we don't quadra value, or the ones we don't really prefer at all, even if we're just using those slightly, slightly. So right now I'm pausing. And I could go in later and cut this out of the video. I'm pausing. What am I really doing, though? I'm trying to pay attention to my own mind and how my own mind works. A pause in the video is just as meaningful as not. Just like in music, if you have a crescendo followed by a come down into silence. Silence is important. Silence is as important to music as clamorous um, clamorous musical activity something on a background of nothing and thoughts words coming out of my mouth come from thoughts but also my silences and my pauses which to me seem like really really long and annoying and I want to and I start thinking about uh, I gotta go cut that out later I gotta cut that out later because I'm trying to manage my perception but then I, I'm having a war in my own mind because I'm not an individual I'm a individual I have different viewpoints now this gets into the territory of personality disorder and if you've studied personality typing and not personality disorders I would say you know if you're confident in or at least pretty confident in your personality typing skills and understanding the theory and all that look into personality disorders because this is something that we can all work on and make the world better because we can look at these things and understand that a lot of the personality disorders are very, very close to personality types. I'm not going to say they're one-on-one. -on -one. When it comes to Enneagram, they seem pretty one-on-one. -on -one. So, like, you have nine Enneagram types and ten official personality disorders of the time being. So, like, the schizoform disorders. That's pretty Enneagram 5. OCPD is Enneagram 1, and so on. Now, the thing about in modern psychology today and pharmaceutical psychology and psychiatry and you know you go into a psychologist or a psychiatrist and they tell you what's wrong with you and they give you a drug they give you a drug because the drugs are well first of all the drugs work for things I don't want to completely discount them but um, they're run by pharmaceutical sales Pharmaceutical sales, uh, you know, there's, there's tons of salespeople. A lot of them are ESTPs. They don't have to be ESTPs. But they're just people who are out there promoting a product to sell it. They're going to tell you about all the bad things that will happen to you if you don't take it. And I'm not even talking about selling it specifically to the consumer. That's done by television commercials a lot of the time. Drug sales happen, and I'm, I'm talking about drugs because drugs are today what is in the main position of fixing our minds. That is the mainstream way of fixing your minds. Yes, there's this kind of therapy and that kind of therapy, but when you go into a mental institution, you can skip all of that stuff. You can skip all the therapy. You can skip the uh, like yoga techniques. You can skip the mindfulness stuff. You can skip all that, but you'll never... Get out of a mental institution without taking drugs. Drugs are the fundamental way we deal with things. Throwing a bunch of chemicals into a very complex mind. And these people don't even understand cognitive functions. Maybe one day. You know, it's, it's not... 
technically science, the thing about cognitive functions, but it's experience. It's, it's science in that this entire community of people talking about typology, it's phenomenological science. It's hard science in that it's so hard that you can actually experience it in your own nervous system. You don't have to look at a sheet of this is what other people experience, so it must be true. No, use your own mind. Maybe this is a, a TI thing more than TE. TI preference more than TE preference. Because, you know, that might not be the perfect thing either. But TE seems to look at you know, pick up established facts, studies and things like that. Or TI is, is more of a thought experience, experiment. I don't, actually, I don't think I'm being, um, oversimplifying things. So anyway, uh, drugs. <laughs> I'm drinking coffee right now. That's a drug. Counting coffee as a drug is important because it changes Changes the way you think. Changes the way I think. Totally. It awakens different parts of what might be called the self. Different individual pieces within the individual that is me. Now, <clears throat> MBTI doesn't have a real good model for this. However, there is something called the Eight Circuit Model of Consciousness which we also must look at if we're going to make a real study of individuality. And uh, the Eighth Circuit Model of Consciousness was developed by Timothy Leary and further expanded upon by Robert Anton Wilson and Antero Ali, and it's used in chaos magic today to do all sorts of fun and interesting things. But uh, it's, it's uh, the only model I know of that really makes a phenomenological map. And sometimes it seems like, you know, the eight circuit model could be put right on top of eight cognitive functions. But that's me, perhaps with a hidden agenda of TI, really just wanting these things to beautifully match up elegantly, easily as that. This map, that map, without actually logically breaking it down. I kind of want that to be true is it is it true is it is it really easy to to put the eight cognitive functions on top of the eight circuit model of consciousness maybe not maybe so i don't know i need an intp i need an intp i've been asking for so long to have an intp to work on this with because my logic is not so much used for actual logical breakdowns of things but rather to get on an interesting idea and have it logically figured out enough to where I can sell it to somebody. Give somebody the emotion. We need to work on this. This might be the truth. And we need to get into it. So that's my, my spiel. And I don't know if I really got anywhere. But um, the, the main points I want to make is I do see a great future for cognitive functions actually going beyond basic pop psychology and people who study this know that they're you know this is phenomenologically true it's a map where you the, the functions are posited you look at your own mind and you find them and not only that you know it, it's in in my experience this might be an ni thing paying attention to my own mind paying attention to my own psychology but the cognitive functions are something that I didn't grow up studying, but I made my own kinds of systems, like little maps of what was going on in my own mind. And later on, there's so many things that I find getting into young and cognitive functions that it's the same stuff. It's the same ter uh, territory that I was mapping, mapping the inside of the mind. And I was doing it like as a, I don't know, 10 year old, 10 year old to 15 year old. And I didn't get into cognitive functions really until, I don't know, when I was 25 or something like that. So looking at the mind and mapping the territory, we seem to be mapping the same kind of territory. 
it's less arbitrary than one might expect. I'm talking about cognitive functions are less arbitrary. They're actually going on within us. And science has no idea yet. But yeah, I think, I think we can use cognitive functions to greatly expand our understanding of mental health. Because right now, the established systems, uh, they don't really pay attention to your ment mental health unless you go crazy and you know, you're, you're in negative states of mind. And then they give you drugs. Drugs are sold by companies who their bottom line is to sell. And that's just the, the, um, how capitalism works. So I'm rambling here. I'm going to cut this off. Thank you for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe. The fuck? Liking and subscribing will make me feel better about myself. It will give me narcissistic supply. Enough to live another day. So I can do something. So I can talk on YouTube more and watch YouTube videos more. Because that's all I got right now. Thank you.